Hey, everyone. Welcome to this next episode of E-Commerce Insights. I'm your host, Scott DeGrossier, founder and CEO of Wicked Reports. Today, I have with me Bill Pescos Alito from the Lido Agency. They are Wicked Report certified partners. They're good at ads. They're good at landing pages, email, copy, basically full funnel service. And I'm excited to talk today with Bill because a lot of times we focus on data and ad strategies, but your ad strategies might ha- be fine and your your data might show <laughs> crap results because of the things we're going to talk about today that Bill specializes in. So thanks for making the time to be on, Bill, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. It's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me on. So let's start with a few definitions and a few like clarifications here to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. So a client might come to you say, Hey, my offer is working good on, I want to scale it, or I don't, I I'm good at marketing, but, or I think I'm good at marketing and I don't know. How do you like look at their like warm versus cold traffic? How do you like even like start your analysis of how you're going to help them? And let's go from there. Sure. So, so kind of giving some context to that, we, we do have many clients who come to us and they have a fairly significant warm audience. And so what, what does that mean? Well, they, they have a presence on social media. So whether you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever the platform is, uh, perhaps they built up a slightly significant email list and maybe hopefully they're emailing that list somewhat regularly. So if they come up with an offer, you know, the first thing most people naturally do is they present it you know, to their warm audience or, or want to present it organically. So they'll post about it on Facebook, they'll email it to their list and they might come to us and say, yeah, you know, I, I did this webinar to my list. You know, my list is really responsive though. And I had a 50% show up rate or even a 60% show up rate for the webinar. And I had a closing ratio, I actually closed 20% of them. And we're like, wow, like that's, that's great. And, but this is, you know, maybe their list is actually relatively small. Maybe it's a list of, you know, two or 3000 people and it's relatively new. It's really, really warm and warmed up and responsive because they just have done a good job building their brand, their personal brand and, and nurturing these emails. And they might come to us saying, okay, look, now I want to scale. Cause I figure, Hey, if I get this many people on my list to buy, you know, 60% showed up and, and, you know, 30% bought. Mm. I just, you know, let me just go to the moon now, you know, Facebook ads. I would think that. (laughs) We're going to be sitting here, you know, swimming in money and it's going to be awesome. And and certainly, while it might not convert as well, you know, once we get out there in cold traffic, certainly this is a proven offer in their minds, right? And so, you know, this should be insane. Well, the challenge is, is that, as you probably know, a 60% show up rate for webinar, I mean, that's pretty strong. And a 30% closing percentage is really, really high. So the, the challenge is, is managing the expectations of a client who has a preconceived notion about their offer and, and how great it's going to be you know, for the general markets out there versus what it was for their really warmed up, lathered up, well-marinated, well-nurtured, very responsive, warm audience. So that, that right there is just managing expectations as, as a challenge because what we found, the other thing is that when you're emailing a list or emailing an offer to your list, or if you're just talking about an offer on Facebook, that's very different than getting it approved from a Facebook ad standpoint, mm. right? You can say almost anything you want in an email. You can't say anything you want in a Facebook ad from a copy standpoint. So there's, there's that obstacle right off the bat. We might have to tweak and massage the language or advise them on tweaking and massaging the language on their landing pages. And certainly I, as the, the guy writing their ads, I certainly have to, to tweak and understand and know like what's going to fly on Facebook from just being uh, accepted as an, off, you know, as an ad versus not. I mean, the greatest offer or the greatest ad you write that doesn't get approved by Facebook <laughs> doesn't get seen by anyone. It's like the old the tree falls in the woods and no one there's to hear it. Does it really fall? Did it really fall? Like if a, if a great ad is written, but Facebook doesn't approve it, was it ever really a great ad or was it written? So that's challenge number one. You can't just necessarily say what you want to say because now we're playing in Facebook sandbox and we got to play by Facebook's rules. The second thing is, is that when you're then hitting, let's say they had a 60% show up rate for the webinar, 
with their nice warmed up lubricated warm audience, uh, you know, that might translate to more something like a 20 or 30% show up rate once you're hitting cold traffic. And that 30% close rate, well, you know, they were on their list. Maybe they had bought something from them before. Certainly they'd followed them online. They've read their blog posts. They've seen their videos on YouTube. They've been on their list for a bit. They really know, like, and trust this individual, this marketer. That cold audience hasn't had that opportunity yet, right? They're just going to Facebook to, to check on what their friends are doing. Right. They're going to Facebook to, to see what the latest dirt is politically. They're, they're going to Facebook to, to post a picture of the lentil bean soup that they had you know, for dinner last night and then maybe like surf for a bit. No one's going to Facebook to buy anything. Right. So you have to think about intent. If I'm on someone's list and I know this is their email marketing list and they send me an email and I, and I choose to open that email, well, from an intent standpoint, I know there's a very good chance I'm going to be marketed to right here by this person. I'm on their list. They're a marketer. They send me marketing emails. If I'm going to open one, yeah, it might be value, but there's probably going to be an offer there as well. On Facebook, that's not the case. No one, no one says like, look, I really need to learn how to generate more leads for my business today. Let me go scroll my Facebook news. <laughs> Yeah. Right? No, they go to Google and they type in how to generate more leads online or so or whatever their their intent is, whatever their interest is that pertains to our client's offer. So the conversion rates are going to drop significantly. It, you know, like that again, that 30% close ratio they had on to their nice warm audience, well, that might end up being like a three or two percent conversion rate for a cold audience. So there's a lot of kind of handholding or massage, you know, massaging expectations that we, that we really need to do with the clients because you just can't let them believe that how it worked when they did it one time to their, their email list, that's going to happen when you start targeting, you know, cold audiences on Facebook. What do you find is maybe, maybe there's a story you've had, or maybe you just can tell us in general terms. So someone has this warm offer that goes like hotcakes. You try it out cold. Maybe it's not quite crickets, but even below what the standard, how much less effective it will be just because the people are cold. What's like your cold traffic resuscitation process? Or what do you look at to say, okay, well, if we're going to show this to a completely cold audience that likes things that indicates they should want your stuff, how do you go about tweaking is the ad or the offer, or the landing page is probably all three potentially. Where do you focus first and what are some things you, you change? So as the agency, it's really difficult for us to tweak the offer, right? The offer is, is the client's unique offer, right? And a lot of times it's, it's their baby, right? So tweaking the offer was probably the last thing we would do or suggest because we don't want to get into being offer creators with our mm -hmm. client. But I think the biggest disconnect from warm to cold is that especially people that have built up a, a, either a loyal or significant established brand, right? When you hit their landing page or their sales page, a lot of times it feels like they've, they're putting too much reliance upon the brand capital that they've developed with their warm audience that a cold audience is not going to care about. Right. Like if I don't know who you are and I'm purely interested in solving my problem, I don't give a crap about how great your personal brand is. Whereas the warm audience might be like, look, I know this person. They put out great stuff. I might buy this thing just because I know that they put out quality stuff. And I got faith because I I bought his I bought her one product for $17 at one point and she over delivered on that. So now that she's got a, a $97 thing. I, I like her. She's funny in her emails. She's great on video. I really resonate with her. Yeah. I mean, it's 97 bucks. I'll go ahead and buy this thing because it's probably going to be good. Mm -hmm. Cold audience is not thinking that way at all. And so specifically, the thing that I feel we almost always have to really go back to the drawing board or help our client go back to the drawing board on is their value proposition, which a lot of times is the headline. I mean, there's some really, really bad headlines. And again, it's because I feel they've just been so reliant upon the fact that I put so much value out in the marketplace. People know, like, and trust me. Yep. I don't really need to spend a lot of time working on a headline. I'm just going to focus more on once they buy my program, delivering the goods, like the content I deliver is going to be awesome. The training I'm going to give them is insane. I know they're going to love this training, but 
you can't sell a cold audience by just saying, look at, I'm, I'm really putting a lot of effort into this. You're going to love this training. Trust me. <laughs> you got to yeah. have a really solid value box. Is yeah, that's it, true. Because like, I can get away with that now. And that wouldn't work with cold traffic. Like, who's this guy that's like unshowered with a random background? <laughs> but it totally works with our audience because I'm always just like getting to the point of the data or helping them work with it so people know I'm going to bring that. But if it's cold, yeah, I wouldn't. I totally see why they'd be like, why am I going to trust this guy in his data dungeon here? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, with stick figures behind him. <laughs> Very elaborate stick figures. <laughs> Ah, uh, so that that's a good point. So so let's say it comes down to the either cold. No, so do you optimize the landing page? Like, what's the process? And is it different landing pages for different stages in the funnel? So there's a cold traffic landing page and maybe a warm, or is it most people probably just maybe I would assume have the same landing page. You got to tweak it, but I mean I don't do the work. You do. What? How does that? Yes. Ideally, because no one necessarily wants to have to create a landing page for this and a separate landing page for that and a third landing page for that, meaning to, to the specific audience, right? So yeah. ideally, we're like, let's just make this one landing page really, really good because we know it, it's already doing, at, at the very least, okay, if not pretty decent with your warm audience. So improving it and make it better for a cold audience is going to almost just by default also make it better for their warm audience. So we don't necessarily delineate between this is a cold audience funnel, that's a warm audience funnel, this is a something in between funnel. Um, it's just making it, it's optimizing it in general. So I think A, th there's oftentimes the, <laughs> the person who's not a seasoned, they might be a, a, they may have created a lot of courses, but they're not really, they're not necessarily direct response copywriters, or they're not good at actually articulating their message in written word, like on a sales page, uh -huh. oftentimes I'll, I'll do a copy call with the client, you know, they'll send me their, their, their page and then we do a copy call to, so I, I do that before I write the ads and they'll say something really good to me in the call. And I'm like, wait, I'm like, why wasn't that on your, on your landing page? Like what you just said was gold. Like that really hit home. That's not on your landing page at any point whatsoever. And they're like, oh, I, I should have that on there. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yes, you you want people to convert, right? So it is a bit of just an educational process for them, and you know they're not necessarily in the trenches from a digital marketing standpoint. Their their niche is their niche, and they're experts at their niche. They're experts at health and wellness, if that's their thing. They're experts at serving the network marketing community, if if that's their thing. They're ex experts at how to raise capital for investors for for real estate, if that's their thing, right? But they're not necessarily in the trenches, digital marketers, and so. There is kind of like that somewhat education that we got to provide to them to be like, yeah, look, if, if you want this thing to convert, you know, you got to do this. And so you got to make that sales page, you know, A, it's a binary decision, right? Any, any landing page, you know, we know it's a binary decision. It's either a yes or a no. You know, a lot of times I'll see that they've thrown in like, well, you could do this or you could do this or you could choose this or you could choose that. I made and, a mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I made that mistake a few times where you schedule a call or buy now or learn more because I get like, I don't want to lose any of those, uh, you know, I, I'm not responsible for that anymore because I'm not good at it, <laughs> but that was a painful mistake that we certainly made. Sometimes we have like five CTAs on a page, five different paths. Horrible. And, and as I'm sure your, your audience probably knows, you know, a confused mind makes no decision. So if you, if you give them too many options or usually even more than just one option, that being the option to say, yes, I want to move forward. You're putting them into a point of confusion. And, and then they're, and if they're sitting there wondering like, well, I don't know, am I supposed to get this one or am I, or am I supposed to click on that? Like, is the next step to book a call or is the next step to get more info? Like th they're confused. And I have this theory that no one allows themselves to be confused or bored online. Right. Like when, like if you're at Thanksgiving dinner, Scott, and you got like your crazy uncle there and you're sitting next to him at the, at the dining room table and, and he's, and he's going on and on and on about old, old stories and you're bored out of your brain, you're going to sit there and you're going to listen because it's your uncle. You see him once a year and you're like, all right, he'll be done talking in like 10 minutes and then I can move on. <laughs> so you'll, you'll allow yourself to be bored out of your tree, like in that moment. No one allows himself to get bored online. Because there's, it's so easy to click the back button. You know instantly, if this thing isn't for me, 
I know within about three seconds, I could probably find 30 other things that are with a simple Google search or, or YouTube search, right? Mm-hmm. So no one allows themselves to get bored online and people aren't going to let themselves get confused. If they start feeling confused, there's a click on the back button. There's too many other things to do. They could go over to sports center. They could go to, you know, they could go check the news, the weather. They could, maybe there's stuff going on in their office or around them. Their kids are lighting the house on fire, right? You're just simply not going to allow yourself to be bored or confused online when there's so many other things just like that you could get access to, which are not boring to you or not confusing you. So that's the thing that I got to talk with our clients about a lot as well is it has to be crystal clear. It's got to be concise. It's got to get to the point and you got to let them know right away that this is for you and here's how it's going to help you out. Because if, if it's not the, the person reading the page, it's not the prospect's job to try and figure out what your message is. It's not their job to try and f- spend time, actually you know, spend time thinking like, wow, I don't understand this quite yet. Let me read further to see if I can understand what they're trying to sell me. No, <laughs> they don't get it right away. It's not crystal clear what the deal is here, th- that this is your pain and this is gonna be a solution for it. They're bouncing. So, and that all can happen in a matter of, two or three seconds. So that kind of gets back to that value prop. If that value proposition is not absolutely crystal clear as to, yes, this is for you. And here's how it's going to help, you know, what problem it's going to solve. They're hitting the back button. They're going on to something else. And especially with Facebook, when they didn't even go there really to buy something to begin with, they went there to, you know, to see what's going on in the world. So do you find with Facebook, what's your ratio when you guys are doing the spend or the effort? Is it more about getting that lead? or going for the sale or some, I mean, it's probably a combination, but mm. how much spend or what percentage of the efforts put versus just getting, capturing that person's lead information over going for the sale? So that's an interesting question because it does vary from client to client. There are some clients who are more lead centric, meaning they're like, look, I really just want to you know, have a lead gen play going you know, as part of our budget, like really consistent, you know, I want to definitely allocate 30% just to generating leads, just to building my list. Um, I've got a really good email follow-up sequence. I got my email stuff pretty dialed in. So I'm really confident that spending a good amount on just generating leads, because I know my email follow-up sequence is going to introduce into offers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Other people are more like, I don't really do a ton of email marketing. I don't have that is part of my repertoire yet. Um, yeah, I have an autoresponder. Maybe I email once a week. You know, I don't really have any follow-up sequences in place, at least not yet. So we do have to, again, kind of a little bit coach and a little bit educate. You know, they're the business owner and they're responsible for all this stuff. Um, but at the same time, we don't feel good just by not sharing this information if they don't know. I mean, Michelle and I are very much involved and we want to see our clients succeed. And we know that there's a lot of things that come into play to make the sales, not just a Facebook ad. You know, I was, I was talking earlier, we were on a meeting and I said, some, some clients are the, of the impression that all you have to do is have Facebook ads going and that that's the magic wand, right? That'll solve everything, right? Even if it's a crappy offer, we'll just pour money into it, pour Facebook ads. Like you guys are an agency. You're good at what you do. Can't you fix this, right? Just with Facebook ads. Yep. But I think, as we all know, it's a holistic thing. You've got follow-up that needs to be done. You've got to have you know, high converting pages. And I was saying earlier, it's kind of like if you owned a storefront, like a brick and mortar store, a retail store, you know, Facebook ads can get people to your front door, but you, the business owner, you have to have some good products in there. You got to have a salesperson in there. You got to have some at the cash register, you know, ready to check them out. You have a lot of things in place. Um, so the Facebook ads can't necessarily just make the sale on their own. They can get a lot of exposure to the offer, right? They can, they yep. can get a million, you know, millions of eyeballs to see that offer. They can get, we can get the people to your storefront, but as a business owner, you got to be there, have the doors open, get them in, have some cool products in there, have salespeople, et cetera, et cetera. So that I think is a, a big component when you're, when you're you know, trying to share. And so, I mean, it's within Wicked Reports. I mean, how many different ways of, of measuring you know, from attribution, you know, the sale, whether with last touch, you know, what was the process? You know, we've, we've actually gone through the journey 
in Wicked reports that within some of our clients, we would look at a specific buyer. Let's just pick random. Okay, Susie Q, she bought your thing. Let's look at what the journey was that it took her. And we can see it, she clicked on this email. She saw this ad. This ad led her to this and that led her to that. And it was maybe six or seven different touches that also yep. we got this person to buy. It wasn't one thing. And that's a really valuable thing about Wicked Reports because it can really give people that more holistic picture of what's really going on. That look, it, it wasn't just a, an email that that got them to buy. It wasn't just a Facebook ad that got them to buy. It's a lot of things coming together holistically that really filled in the the puzzle. And so you can see the picture of what got them from cold to a buyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a. A feature being worked on now called sales assist, kind of like in hockey, getting an assist on a goal. Yeah. So the goal gets the points, the revenue, but then in the month leading up to the sale, any touch point that led to a sale within the month, is going to get an assist. So then you'll see it could be like, because a lot of people will say, well, I know Facebook is driving my other channels and sometimes they're right. And sometimes they're completely batshit <laughs> crazy on it, but this will just be, well, we'll know for sure. Like if there's like 400 assists to this campaign and they actually closed on a great email, well, you'll know without having to investigate. And if not, then so be it. Because that's a lot of, uh, and I want to talk to you about email because that's a lot of that happens now, particularly with the iOS changes and the shorter windows. Facebook's modeling their data now, so it's kind of optimistic. But we do find people with the bigger spends, the six-figure spends a month, like will show a lot less. We'll, uh, on the short term, we'll show less sales, and on the longer term, we'll show more because we got lifetime value. But a lot of times people say, well, I, how can you be showing less revenue than Facebook, even though that's why you bought us? And we'll be like, well, your, e your Clavio emails are showing 200 grand. Do you not think those are the sales? Like, oh yeah, those are the sales, but they just want the Facebook number higher. But with the email, how does a, and one thing I'll say is because like the pre-Wicked reports, before I even had the brand name, I used to run this ad hoc spreadsheet Wicked reports. <laughs> And I had this guy, he was on a, a British uh, reality show, makeover show, and he made a celebrity selling people's fixing their teeth or whatever, you know, celebrity makeover or something. So he paid, I don't know, some ungodly amount for emails. And they were, they were not bad. They were good looking, but they were really long and just dull. They were really just dull though. And he mm. could not believe how low the attribution was in the email, like how low the sales revenue was. And we're like, well, if we had none, then we know it's a tracking problem. But we have some and we can see other paths that are closing them. So it's the email. And he was just distraught. He never got over it. Like he always wanted to bring up the email tracking because <laughs> it just, the emails weren't any good, costing him money. So like, how do you, how do you guys approach like the email copy? Like, so you got the lead, is it? So they're cold coming in. Do you have a certain sequence just based on the magnet that got them in? And then you get into the overall sales flow or how do you strategize around the email? Because I know so, that's the forefront of your stuff. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a, it's a complex question because it can, it can vary from client to client. And, and we have to, as an agency, kind of understand where they are from an email marketing standpoint, like on a scale of one to 10, as far as just their experience and acumen, right? Like, are they, mm -hmm. if they're a one on a scale of one to 10, you got to handle them differently than if they're like an eight or nine on a scale of, you know, a one to 10, as far as their experience. The big thing I find is that, especially when it's the business owner, you know, so m many of our clients are solopreneurs or small business owners, and you know, maybe they've got a team in place, but the team is anywhere from one to five people or, or so forth. And they don't necessarily, or, not necessarily, they don't have a copywriter on board or on staff. They're like, look, I've, I took a writing class in college. You know, I own my business. I know it better than anyone. I can write these emails and they should be fine. Right. And maybe I'll do a quick course or I don't know, just do a watch a video on how to write emails or something. And they think that all mm -hmm. sounds great. And so I'll maybe go through their email follow-up sequence. And I realize, like, okay, did you know that like during this entire email follow-up sequence, you just talked about yourself and your product the whole entire time. Like you never once talked about the prospect and like what's in mm. it for them or the podcast email that you just sent out. It was like just this really weird looking form. Like almost like the pod, like you just copied and paste what it looks like, you know, the podcast itself looks like you plop that in the email and yeah. 
And it, and it talked about, look, look, today I'm interviewing Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo is 10 years this and 20 years that and the CFO of this. And he's amazing. And Joe's the best. And Joe, 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 Joe. And, and then click the podcast. And I'm like, you didn't explain it even in the slightest what, what problem they're going to talk about and what, how they might solve that and how it's going to help this person. Like you didn't ever consider your actual prospect and your reader and what's going on in their mind and what problems do they have? You, you, you got them to open your email in some cases, right? Mm-hmm. You, you got them there. Like talk to them about them, how you can help them. Not about how you're so excited to show off your brand new shiny thing. So it's, it's just like, again, trying to help them. Like you, you, you got to write for them, not write for yourself. <laughs> yeah. No one, no one cares about you ultimately. You know, you could sit here and say, look, I'm coming on board today and I have all this experience. I know all these things. I've done this, that, and the other. Here's my expertise. And end it right there. Someone's going to be like, okay, so what does that do for me? What does that yeah. mean for me? Versus if I said, here's what I'm coming, here's what I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to share with you how you know, in my 10 years experience, I would learn to overcome this, that, and the other. And how, you know, if you apply these six things I'm going to talk about, you can overcome them as well. Right. That's a very different yeah. angle. And it's a slight little shift. And you don't have to be some like super duper advanced copywriter to, to shift, you know, writing for your prospect and writing for your audience and serving them versus just writing about yourself. But that's kind of a thing that we see. And I guess the other thing is the real simple thing we, when we ask them about the emails and this and that, I just say, what's your open rate? What's your click-through rate? Open rate, boom, right away. Okay, headlines. If your open rate's really bad, it's the headline thing. If the click-through rate is really bad, it could be, well, A, a lot of times they'll have like, for this, go here. For that, go there. For this, click here. To join me on Facebook, click here. <laughs> to off, click here. Like, yeah. like, I'll have like nine call to actions in this one email. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> what is the business intent of this one email? You can't have like seven different business intents in this one email. You have one call to action, one intent. What does this one, what are you trying, what behavior are you trying to get them to do in this one email? And that's it, right? Focus on the one action you want them to take. If you want them to go listen to your podcast, that's fine. Make it only about your podcast. If you want them to read your new blog post, that's fine. Make it just about the blog post. If you want them to check out your new offer, great. Make it about the offer and how it's going to help them. But don't have like nine links in there. And now follow me on Instagram. And here you can see me on TikTok. <laughs> They're just gonna be like, "What the hell? Like, which one do I click?" And if they don't know which one to click, they're not. They're gonna click the back button, and you'll end up in the in the spam folder pretty soon. I, I presented once at a what was it called Traffic and Conversion Summit. It was like four years ago, and it was on adventures in email data. And I had my friend Mark, who runs Get Main Lobster, up there, and I would tease him about his emails, but they actually worked real well because no, he'd always start with whatever the, the topic because he's ecom. He just basically, and he's selling lobster. So basically, blah, blah, blah. I want you to buy my lobsters. <laughs> and that's every email. So, but the subject, he couldn't just say sale, sale, sale. So what he started doing was, you know, whatever the topic is, uh, I guess Father's Day coming up. So Father's Day blowout sale, or he had his birthdays in July, birthday game. He has his birthday game, right? And it was this complex thing where every hour in his birthday, the, you, the, the percentage of the sale you're going to get went down 1%. So I read the email. I was like, this is terrible. I mean, I don't, I, how, people are going to be clicking. They're going to want the 58%. But now you're saying, hey, it's only 52 because it's 3 p.m. <laughs> well, lo and behold, we ran. And, and furthermore, he resends the same email eight hours later to anyone that didn't buy. So you get the same email twice, which you think would be irritating, right? Which probably was irritating to many people. But lo and behold, at the time, he does better now, but his average email revenue was 2000 bucks an email, which is everything's relative. Some people, that's amazing. Some would be like, oh my God, I'm going to go bankrupt. For him, it was like, whatever, so-so. And then he, did, he sent the two emails. He did 18000 bucks, And he was like, I was like, you know what? This is why you don't rely on opinions. Like, I'm sure your mother was all excited. She'd always write Wayne and Wayne with an opinion on his email. And then me and my brother, we were working with him at the time. We'd like give him shit, <laughs> always razzing each other. We were like, oh my God, this is a new low, this email. And it was actually an amazing email. It did nine times the revenue, but he stuck with one thing. It was always like, I'm going to have a little bit of a story, but at the end of the day, I just want you to buy my stuff. And it was always the same. And every email just kept him entertained and not 
Do you have you found email stats of real? I mean, because open and clicks is what made me think of that. Because yeah, opens is usually the headline. The right. click is is the email getting them to the page. And then the sales are, did they ultimately buy from all this razzmatazz, which is the point of it, right? Yeah. So I found that was an interesting like third step to look at. Did people buy? You never know. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's fun. You know, I, I like, so I, I, I find this stuff fun, right? In, in the sense that like, it's very interesting to me. I like it. I like to kind of nerd out on things like this. I like learning about like conversion optimization and persuasion and, you know, how to, you know, get better open rates and click-through rates and things like that. For some people that's, and I'm not even a data guy, like I'm more of, I like things that can convert more, but that doesn't mean I necessarily love spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the process. <laughs> how to no do one it. likes a spreadsheet as much as me. I don't take offense to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, know, you have other people that, that aren't, there's kind of like, oh, this seems like, can I just like create this offer and can't you just drive Facebook ads to it? And isn't that like the magic elixir? And you, you mentioned TNC and, you know, Ryan Dice has a saying that there are no such things as a traffic problem. There's only an offer problem. If you have a really solid offer, like it's dialed in from a messaging standpoint, it's you know priced well, the sales page is good, it's, it's firing all cylinders, and you put that in front of Facebook, I mean, how many millions and millions and millions of people are on Facebook? Are you telling me that you can't get eyeballs to that to have it convert? Like, no, there's not a traffic problem. Traffic's everywhere. Yeah, right? there's no shortage of traffic anywhere, and not, not even just Facebook. I mean, there's obviously there's there's Google, YouTube, there's, search. I mean, yeah. There's so many other things now. And so there aren't traffic problems, there are offer problems. Now, that's a tough sell when you're the agency telling that to a client. <laughs> you're like, hey, there's no traffic problems, only an offer problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, not my words, blame Ryan Dice. No. <laughs> you kind of got to gently massage your way into that conversation. But the reality is that's just the fact, right? And so, and, and people sometimes do get, you know, they, they, their offer becomes their baby. And they think, well, you know, you kind of say, well, my mom thought this was great. My mom thought this, you know, offer was the best thing since sliced bread. And when I emailed it to my very, very warm email list of 500 email subscribers, a ton of them bought. I'm like, okay, what's a ton? 40. Okay. <laughs> so you have 40 people that said yes, that were really warmed up, that knew you very well. Okay. That, that, now that we get onto Facebook and it's a paid platform and we're putting this out to a cold audience you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit different and you've got to, you, you, people need to understand that from an offer creation standpoint, whether we're talking just the offer itself, the message to, to market match, to the sales page, the value proposition, these things I've kind of been mentioning, it's got to be, it's got to be dialed in if you want to play with the big boys and, you know, put it out into cold traffic, you know, paid traffic. And because the market is going to tell you, they're going to tell you, <laughs> they're going to give you the feedback. Right. We always tell people we, opinions are great, but we like to give recommendations based on data. Like you said earlier, like everyone can have an opinion, but none of that really matters until you test it and see what did the market say. And the market is what tells us is this is this a winner or or not. Kind of like you've mentioned before you know, on ads, do you do you you know do you kill it? Do you chill it? Do you scale it? So it's you can't make that decision until you have the data back to allow us to look at that and based on our experience make recommendations and decisions, but we use the data to do that. So when you're dealing with a client who might not be as data driven or data focused, they just want, you know, and everyone always says, especially if asked, say, well, how much budget do you have? Well, as long as you're making money, I have an unlimited budget. <laughs> everyone says that. You know what? It's I found myself almost saying it and I was like, well, it technically is true. You do feel that way, but I caught myself the last minute when I was talking recently to our paid yeah. team. You know, and okay. it's like, everybody says that. Yes. Yes. How awesome. much do you have until if you're only breaking even, can you spend? <laughs> exactly. And so that's the way we kind of reframe it. Like how many months can you, could you go or how much money could you go if we're just testing, right? What's your, what's your appetite there? What's your bandwidth there? Because that's really the question. I mean, everyone says, oh, as long as I put a dollar in and get two back. And that's like, <laughs> I, I, yeah. if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I'd be you know, in Fiji right now doing this podcast with you. <laughs> Everyone says, if as long as I'm putting a dollar and getting two back, you know, we're good. I'm like, that's, yep. that's <laughs> can you get the two back 120 days out? <laughs> then you could actually really make some serious money if you can do a 90 day view. But 
people mm-hmm. don't often think that way. I find correct, that and I sense. get it. You know, because they're they're paying. You know, they're paying us as an agency, which is not even their ad costs. You know, this isn't monopoly money. This is real money. This is their real cash flow. Their real marketing dollars, and and we're very you know aware of that and sensitive to that. But at the same time, there you you have to allow for the process to unfold. You have to allow for Facebook to do its thing, for us to do our thing, for us to test different audiences. You know, we might start with 12 audiences and end up with three, you know, but we won't know which three audiences it's going to be at the beginning, which is why we have to test many, many audiences before we find the ones that are winners. That's, that takes time. It just doesn't happen overnight. And so it's kind of like, you know, yeah, how, how willing are you to pay for testing? Because we don't really know yet, especially if this has just only been presented to your warm audience. We, and they think it's a proven offer. They've convinced themselves in their minds it's a proven offer because it did do well for the warm audience. But when you get to them, you know, ads, you know, paid ads, cold audiences, it hasn't been proven out in the marketplace yet per se. So it's it's kind of a whole new world and there's mm-hmm. some learning, you know, bumps and obstacles and learning curves that come along with that. So this has been great. I mean, I think we learned a lot about the kind of like the overall strategic approach to the conversion rates and the optimizations and how you got to approach it, where you got, where the gotchas are. So it really was like an all encompassing area. Cause once you get the traffic, then the real work starts. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. It does. So uh, where can people uh, find you and learn more about you? Absolutely. They can go to the Lido agency.com. So the Lido agency.com. That's our website. And uh, yeah, come check us out there. Great. All right. Thanks for being on, Bill. Absolutely, Scott. It's a pleasure. Look forward to doing this again. Yep.